Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with an epic announcement. The Bruckner cult has its Bible. Finally, it's called the Red Book, colloquially. And here it is. William Carrigan and the Bruckner Society of America. Note they have a seal with Bruckner's little ugly little mug in there has published a little book called Bru Anton Bruckner, 11 Symphonies, but it's really called The Red Book. And as such, it joins an illustrious list of prior Red Books dedicated to cults of varying qualities. There are some good cults and there are some ba bad cults. Let's not, let's not make a mistake about that. For example, one of the original Red Books was this, The Little Red Book. This is the original Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program known as the Little Red Book. There you go, 1946, the original edition. Then, of course, there was Chairman Mao's Red Book, his Little Red Book. Isn't it marvelous? I mean, you know. And so joining this illustrious group of Red Books is the Bruckner Red Book. And if any more evidence need be to be adduced that the Bruckner cookies represent a cult, and I mean a cult. All you have to do is look at the blurb on the, on the jacket here. We'll do that in a second, shall we say. What are the qualities that make a cult? Well, first of all, you need a deity. And we have a deity. The deity is Bruckner. It's quite simple. Bruckner is God. That's all. God. Bruckner. God. Same thing, right? What's the difference? Bruckner. So they have a deity. And we know that they have a deity. And what's more, everything that deity did is treated as sacred. There can be no distinction made between you know, relevant significance, importance, quality, or any other criteria. Because he did it, it is sacred, period. Never to be questioned, never to be judged. And that is exactly the point of this. Now, this never to be judged business, I shall say, is, is, is couched in quasi-scientific terms, which I find rather, rather amusing. The, the preface, which is by Benjamin Korsvet, the, the author of that, you know, grotesque, 1888 or whatever it is, version of the Fourth Symphony that should never have been revived because it's not by Bruckner. They have said, he says as follows, William Carrigan, he writes, my great Bruckner friend. Notice it's Bruckner friend. You're a Bruckner friend. That's like, you know, fellow in Jesus. You know what I mean? You're a Bruckner friend. That is your one in the, in the body of Bruckner. My great Bruckner friend and vice president of the Bruckner Society has written this study with the express intent of dispelling the state of confusion by the seemingly simple of expedient of presenting a detailed objective, objective account of each symphony, whether it exists in only one version, as do the sixth and the seventh, or in multiple variant versions, as with the third and fourth. Upon reading this study, however, it will become immediately evident that the task is far from simple, especially since Professor Carrigan approaches it with great perspicacity. Great perspicacity. He is not at all interested in offering easy, categorical identifications of the best or most authentic versions. Of course not. He can't be. Rather, he seeks to present a full picture of the revisions, modifications, and changes that Bruckner made to each of his symphonies. The result is a unique and enthralling, note, enthralling picture of an exceptional musical mind at work across some three decades. So you see, there is no attempt to tell you that any one bit is better than any other bit. This is what God did and you should care about all of it equally. So, that's step one. You have your sacred texts, and you have, and they are sanctified. Now, once you have a deity, and the deity has given you sacred texts, those sacred texts need, need to be interpreted, and they are interpreted by his disciples. 
Now, the principal one of those is Leopold Novak, who was the second sort of major head of the International Bruckner Gesellschaft and published bunches of critical editions. And he's the one who got, who got uh, Carrigan involved in all of this stuff by editing the Second Symphony. However, however, let me get this thing here. Wait a minute. I have to tell you. One of the ways that his principal disciple is, is elevated to discipleship is in the way he is always spoken of. Because Novak, Novak was a Hofrat, and William Carrigan always refers to him as Hofrat Novak. Not Leopold, not Dr. Novak, not just plain Novak. It's always Hofrat Novak. Why? Well, you have to think about it. What's a Hofrat? A half rat is like a, a rat that lives in a castle as opposed to a house rat, which is a rat that lives in a house. No, but seriously, a half rat is simply a magistrate of the Holy Roman Empire. They haven't really existed since around the 16th century, but in Austria, everybody has a title. Your plumber has a title. He's like Wasser rat, you know? I mean, your, 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 your waiter has a title. He's like, he's like Essen rat. They all have titles. Everyone in Austria has a title. You're a doctor if you graduated from high school. You get to be called Dr. Something. That's Austria because, because Austria is a country, you have to understand, is a bureaucracy with nothing to supervise. All that was left after World War I of Austria was the bureaucracy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and all of the other countries around it became independent and so you had this bureaucracy and so what did they do? They gave each other titles and they pretended that they all were important doing something, even if they were only like your local florist. That's Austria, okay? And so Novak, who was like in charge of what used to be the Imperial Library and is now the State Library, he, he, he became a Hofrat. That was his title. It meant librarian, <laughs> whatever it was he did. So he's always referred to as Hofrat Novak. That elevates him to the level of principal disciple. And Carrigan is a disciple of the disciple. Or you might say he's a disciple of the apostle. I don't know. However you want to do it. So you have the, the chain of descent, of, of communication, of holy writ through God to his apostles and hence to the disciples, foremost among them, Mr. Carrigan. Uh, anyway, so, so there we have another element of the Bruckner cult. Now, in order to make the cult even more like officially cult-like, one of the things that they all do naturally is insist that you immerse yourself in the cultness in, in, in the holy texts, that is, the Bruckner symphonies, to the extent of all else. And this is how they suggest you do it. I love this. This is just the blurb, the jacket blurb. Let's, let's, let's look at this. This book can be used as a reference work and a guide to the principal manuscript sources of the symphonies. But it can also be read like a novel. Oh, really? Like a novel? Well, let's... I don't know, let's just pick something. What's this? Let's pick something at random and see. Oh, look. Okay, so this is about the overture in G minor. Here is the climax of this chapter of the novel. There is a sizable development and a complete recapitulation where the B2 or C theme leads directly to a coda and a final broadened statement of the A theme in the major. This last part was substantially revised in January 1863, at Kitzler's suggestion, where the original bright triumphal two-wave coda was replaced by a sober chorale of six-four chord phrases, retaining only the final slow statement of the A theme. Both endings are given in the Kremsmünster manuscript, but it is the second version that is now almost always played. Now there, I mean, let's face it, James Joyce, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Emily Bronte, George Eliot, <laughs> all of you, Charles Dickens, gosh, not, they don't hold a candle to the thrill-packed, novel-esque excitement of this particular narrative, do they? Now, 
Let us continue that with this, this jacket blurb. So let's see. But, but it can also be read like a novel as it tells the stories chronologically for each symphony. Once upon a time, there was a symphony, right? Okay. Making clear when the changes were made, as well as detailing their character through the many musical examples, it seems that in each case, the reason for making the change was different. Sometimes from Bruckner's own new thoughts, some to facilitate performance, and also probably some from the urging of others, though he was felt by his friends to be very resistant to outside influence, and some changes were made behind his back. You gotta have a devil. Every cult has its devil, doesn't it? One way to come, here we go, get ready folks, to an appreciation of the development of any one of the symphonies is for the listener to choose one, select three or four recordings of it, <laughs> preferably using different versions, and devote an evening to just that one symphony. It's going to be a long evening. Hearing it from beginning to end and successfully recognizing each place where the music was changed according to Bruckner's developing thoughts. Like that's really going to happen on a first listen? The three or four versions of the same symphony? Really? Seriously? <clears throat> Due to their extensive revision, one might have to devote two evenings each to the third and fourth. Each version of each symphony has its own distinctive character so that certain passages will sound their best in that version. Happy listening. What are they, crazy? Has anyone ever listened to Bruckner that way? Does anyone want to listen to Bruckner that way? If you were interested in music, for music's sake, because you love music. Is that how you would approach listening to a Bruckner symphony? I have listened to Bruckner and loved Bruckner and written about Bruckner for 35, 40, 40 years, 35 years. And I have never in my life ever listened to two complete versions back to back of a Bruckner symphony on the same day, ever. And you know what? It hasn't done any harm. None at all. None at all. I mean, this is crazy talk. This is cult talk. That is, you have to immerse yourself to the point where you instantly know <laughs> in a A-B comparison, your first time ever through what Bruckner did, what the differences are, whether they're harmonic or textural or, or formal. I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin with that. But you, you see where it's going. You see where it's going. This has nothing, nothing to do with the experience of listening to music because it begs the question, why do we listen to Bruckner at all? Do we listen to it in order to become one with the deity, in order to penetrate his innermost thoughts? Or do we listen to it because we want to experience the expressive impact of a great piece of music, period. That's why all of us listen to music, isn't it? But that's not what these people are doing. They are worshiping. That's how you worship Bruckner, by playing 10 versions of the Fourth Symphony all at one sitting. And when you've completely zoned out and zombified yourself, you might actually start to have some kind of out-of-body experience. And that's, that's how it's supposed to work. That's how it's supposed to work. I find that extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. But of course, there is, there is the benefit the benefit of doing this, of subjecting yourself to this form of oral torture, because that's what it is, is that, is that you somehow come to understand or tell yourself that you can understand the workings of a musical genius, the workings of his thought. But see, that's where, that's where the cult aspect relies on the final element of the cult mentality, and that is faith. Faith that this nonsense actually means something. What does it mean? Seriously, what does it mean? So you, let's say you listen to, to bar 76 of the Fourth Symphony finale in its first version, and then you listen to bar 76, which actually became bar 
47 because there was a cut in the final version of the finale of the fourth symphony and in the first version it's scored for horns and trumpets and in the last version he adds trombones what have you learned what has changed how has your experience of the symphony changed you see they can tell you what Bruckner did but what they can't tell you it's impossible for them to tell you is why he did it and what it means. They can only speculate <laughs> and your guess is as good as anyone else, but, but they can't tell you even what impact it has. They can't tell you how it changes the effect of the music on you, the listener, from one version to the next, the effect of one passage, the effect of a group of passages. None of that. All they can do is what Kerrigan has done and admirably is make a list, a list of all the variants and versions, but, and that's fine. If that's as far as this went, it would not be the Bruckner Bible because what comes from, what makes it biblical is the fact that these things are supposed to be invested with meaning and you have to have an irrational faith that that meaning conveys itself to you if you spend enough time dwelling on it and going through it. And that, my friends, is cult behavior. Textbook cult behavior. It's gussied up as, you know, scientific method and objective objectivity, but there's nothing objective about this at all because fundamentally it's an irrational enterprise. It's an enterprise that says forego choice, forego judgment, forego your personal taste, forget about trying to simply listen to music for itself as a means of enjoyment and just pick what you like and forget about the rest. No, what it's telling you is that you can become one with the deity if you have faith in the fact that everything he wrote is as meaningful as everything else he wrote and therefore is entitled to the exactly the same amount of time and dedication and energy and, and intensity and reverence. That's what they're saying. And not only is that an abomination, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of, you know, how people should listen to music. I mean, how people should enjoy and how most people do listen to music and do enjoy it. I mean, there's a big difference between just listening to music and enjoying it and wanting to be a cult member. I mean, to be a cult member, you have to do what the cult wants. If you want to enjoy a piece of music, you'll enjoy a piece of music. There's a big, big difference. So, you know, between that and what these people are telling you to do. I remember, I remember vividly when I was in, you know, Jewish religious school, and this is something that really struck me on, 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 on reading this. You know, when you study the Talmud, one of the things, which is 70 some odd volumes, one of the things that fa is fascinating about it is that, is that there is as much argumentation and disputation. I mean, the Talmud, in case you didn't know, is, is the book of, of Jewish law, one of many, but the first major book of Jewish law that, that interprets the words of the Torah, the five books of Moses, principally. And it's simply a discussion of how to interpret what this means. And you see disputes between rabbis down through the, through the, the, the centuries, um, giving all their different opinions, and you study these you know, in order to arrive at, you know, the correct meaning of the biblical text. One of the things that's fascinating is that these disputes are just as significant over thou shalt not kill as they are, well, the dimension of the ark is 26 and a half cubits by 14 cubits, and how long is a cubit, and did it have to be made of cedar, or could you use oak, or, you know, anything that is completely irrelevant to any experience of religion today. But, but because the entire Torah is regarded as the word of God, every word is as important as every other word. Consequently, they spend just as much time arguing over things which are completely irrelevant and nonsensical for us today as they do things that are deeply profound and ex extremely meaningful. I mean, that's the nature of cultism. 
that's what it is. And here you see it at its most eloquent. And that is what makes the Red Book the Bible of the Bruckner cult. Now, I purchased this copy and I'm telling you, it costs 50 bucks and you get it directly from the Bruckner Society. I have no problem giving, giving them a plug for it. It's beautifully done. It's wonderfully put together. I mean, not only, not only does it have 4 billion musical examples, but each musical example has one of these, 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 these quick read, intelligent read barcode things. So you can get an app downloaded to your iPhone and you can go to the website and actually hear the musical example in question if you're curious. And the more involved they make it, the deeper <laughs> they, they drag you into the cult, the easier it is to surrender your individuality, your personal taste, your feelings, your, your perfectly justifiable suspicion that all of this is garbage and that, and that we should listen to the versions that Bruckner himself preferred. Because remember, at the end of the day, this has nothing to do with doing justice to Bruckner. This is about telling fellow cult members how wonderful they are and how, how devoted they are to the divine truth and the deity from whence that divine truth springs. That's what this is about. This has virtually nothing to do with the experience of listening to music, enjoying music. The reason most people listen to music, they want you to get into the cult. It's to make more cult members. That's what cults do. And boy, oh boy, I mean, I, 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 I it really, it really, it really brought home to me seeing this thing. And I paid for my own. I, you know, this is, this is, this is my own, my own initiative here because I want to talk about this. I just think it's so telling. There are all kinds of cults in the music world. You know it and I know it. There's the Fort Fingler cult. There are artist cults of all kinds. There's the Horenstein cult. There are conductor cults. There are singer cults. There's the Maria Callas cult. There's, you know, <laughs> the Tiziana Fabricini cult. Who knows? There are a million different cults in the music world, right? We, we, we all know about them and we all think the people are a little nutty, but I don't think any cult in the world of classical music has ever been as systematically constituted and as clearly modeled on prior cults <laughs> as the Bruckner cult and the Bruckner Society of America in publishing their red book. I mean, it's really incredible. I, I, I'm just I'm a little bit flabbergasted. I really am. So I just wanted to bring that up as a either a recommendation if you are seeking to join the cult or as a cautionary tale if, like me, you regard the whole thing as kind of sad. Because as I said, what is this to do with Bruckner? Bruckner, as we know, he did not make changes to his work, hoping that future generations would regard everything as equally good. He made changes because he didn't like the last one and he wanted you to listen to the later one because he thought it was better. And somewhere in this farrago of, of irrational, quasi-mystical falderall, there is the intention of the composer. There's, there's what he wanted us to hear and why he wanted us to hear it, what he thought was most representative of himself. And what the cult is doing as a soi disant act of reverence is to strip the volition, the will of the composer away from him. And in exchange for that, they elevate him to the status of a deity. I have a suspicion that Bruckner, who was deeply, devoutly Catholic, would have been horrified at that notion. He knew who his God was. He knew who his savior was. And he would have found any suggestion that he himself was that person to be little short of blasphemous. He really would have. And so at the end of the day is the red book. So keep on listening, folks. I can't tell you what to listen to or why, but if the Bruckner cult is going to be your thing, 
I mean, look at the bright side. I mean, at least it isn't like the Unification Church. I mean, there are other cults you could join that are worse. I, I, the Red Brigades, you know, they're red too. I mean, it's possible there are others. At least this one is relatively harmless in terms of the, the potential to do massive societal harm. I don't think it's so harmless in terms of your, your, your musical health, but that's a personal decision. So keep on listening, folks. Thank you for joining me. Take care.